In this episode of An American Entrepreneur, we're going to a martial arts academy. And before I chose which academy I was going to reach out to, I did a lot of research. And this specific one has been in business here in Dallas, Texas for over 40 years, and they have very high reviews. The master instructor we're going to meet is named Mr. Garvin Garcia. Check it out. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for having me here, Master Instructor Garcia. All right, Garvin, so introduce yourself. Garvin Garcia, owner, operator, master instructor of the Dallas Academy of Martial Arts here in Lake Highlands. Okay, so how long have you been in business here? This business has been here since 1980. Bobby Autry, the founder, the first master instructor of uh, the academy here, began in 1980 in, in different you know, strip centers over the years, here in this location, probably, gosh, 25 years or so. We're at the corner right here, Plano and Walnut. Then it passed from him to his son, Shane Autry, who became, who also became a fifth degree black belt, who then uh, passed away tragically at 38. Bobby Autry uh, had sold him the business when he retired. Came out of retirement to keep the place going. He didn't want to see his life's work fade into oblivion. At that time, I had just bought into another business in the wholesale gift business, but you know, he approached me early on, hey Garvin, you know, you're the highest ranked student here, you're the most experienced instructor, you're pretty good with the kids, why don't you consider buying this place? Well, I had sunk all my money into that other enterprise uh, at the Dallas Trade Mart, and I was in a position to do it. But after a few years of doing that, he hung on, he kept the place going. I kept attending here as a student and instructor. One is never finished learning in martial arts. Right. Uh, and then I was able to get out of that business and I was finally in a position, Bobby, let's talk. We negotiated over almost a year and then I took over in 2018, been the okay. uh, owner since. How did you discover martial arts? How did it come into your life? This academy regularly donates to different uh, silent auctions, fundraisers around uh, the area with all the elementary schools, and we're parishioners at St. Patrick's. Our kids went there, and we're at the uh, annual fundraiser, and we see this, hey, a, a trial membership, six-week trial membership. Our son at the time, my son Gil, was in the first grade, I think, uh, he, super athlete, into everything. We thought, well, let's give him another challenge and let him try this. He'd had some friends who were in it as well, and they loved it, and we bid on it. We didn't think we'd win. We won. He loved it. Made his progression all up to the belts and the whole time kept encouraging me to join. Dad, you'll love this. You got to join. Come on, man. Do it with me. Even though the juniors and the adults don't practice in the same classes, he wanted to do it, you know, as a thing together. And I made him this promise that, you know, there are 10 belts from white to black. And before you get to your sixth belt, before you get halfway through, I'll join. The day he was testing for that sixth belt, I walked in, Shane, you got to sign me up. And he put me on the other line, got my uniform, and I was in class that next week. So I kept my promise to him. Been at it ever since. Dropped all my other sports. I was playing indoor soccer and doing other things. Right. And so into it right off the bat. So much fun. Uh, I encourage other dads, friends of mine, to join too. And we all came up through the ranks together. It's pretty fun. So at first you didn't think, oh hell, what did I get myself into? Not I mean, enough. how did you know you were going to like it? You know, I was a gymnast in high school, pretty decent gymnast. So Out of high school, I played uh, racquetball in the in the 80s, mid 80s. It was a popular sport. Then I got into rec softball, just trying to stay active, you know. My kids come along and then I got into indoor soccer. I played that a few years. That is some fun stuff. A lot of bumping and shoving right. and, you know, playing soccer indoors on a smaller field. Then I started here when, through that inducement of that encouragement from my son, and I've never looked back. Love this sport. Challenging, you know, balance, strength, flexibility. 
kind of fun to spar too, you know. And at the time, you had no idea that you would be owning. No idea that I would like it as much as I did. Uh, I ended up coming up to the ranks making black belt. It was a goal to make black belt, and I just wanted to stay active after that. My hand on a Bible, I can say I've never over the years asked for a promotion. I always just figured they'll recognize it and they'll promote me when I'm ready. And they offered me, hey, Garvin, we think you're ready. You need to test for second degree. Second degree black belt is considered assistant instructor level. So then I started teaching some classes. I got to be pretty good at it. If I had to evaluate my core ability, it would be to, I'd say it was an ability to break it down, get to the essence and convey that. Why do you need to do this? Why do you need to know, learn that or know that? Or why should this be important to you? And I'm able to break it down like that to people. It makes me an effective teacher. You know, when I was doing research, of this industry before I met you, mm -hmm. before we agreed to do this interview, I noticed online there's a lot of online classes, just a ton of these classes. And I was wondering, has that changed your business at all? And if it has, in what way? And also, do you feel like it might be a, a little bit of a threat to a brick and mortar style teaching academy such as yours? Interesting. Uh, short answer, no. It's not a threat to me. There's, there are a number of reasons why, but the longer answer is, I don't think there are many people who are beginners who are gonna watch that same video over and over and over and over and over again to get it right. And how would they know they're getting it right? Nobody there to critique No them. supervisor to tell them, nope, fix this. No, that's something you're overlooking. There's no substitute for being a, in the presence of an instructor who can correct the small things, emphasize the important things. How has it affected my business? We, we also have a number of videos. I think we posted 115, 119, but they're on our private Facebook page for paid, enrolled, in good standing students. We don't put them out there on, on YouTube, for example, because who, who knows us in right. all over the US? The people in Lake Highlands know who we are, but if they wanna come and join and practice these things at home the right way, then they can join, join our Facebook, I'll let them in to the private group and they can see all of these videos whenever they wish. But there's so many out there. Every time we're working with any level of student and they're having trouble with one move or another, I tell them all the time, it's nothing a thousand reps can't fix. So right. let's go, let's get to number. 106. Let's get to number 271. Let's get to number 412. Come on. You know? Right. And it's that repetition all through the early belts that lays the foundation. Why do those higher belts look so good? Because they've done it a thousand times. Right. You know? So, no, it's not a threat to me, I don't think. It doesn't really affect my business, except, I guess, in an ancillary way, one, it, it encourages and inspires people to want to come find out about us. Right, they can see people doing these beautiful kicks. And I think, need to I'm go to that to gym. That. Exactly, I can go to the gym and and then they look up online. We have a stellar reputation. What's your style? What style do you guys teach here? Good question. The discipline is Taekwondo. We tell people we're based in Taekwondo because we've incorporated so many more styles. There's a bit of judo in some of our throws. There's a lot of jujitsu basics in our ground game because. The statistics are that most confrontations end up on the ground. Right. So you don't you want gotta to know what you're doing. There, right. You don't want to be completely lost. It doesn't it doesn't help to learn self defense if you don't learn it all. And there's some Aikido uh, moves thrown in with our higher level learning. So though we're based in Taekwondo, we incorporate other stuff bits of other styles. Not to be confused with the Olympic style Taekwondo that fighting with the hands down, constantly hopping, beautiful fast kicks. Excellent type of martial arts. But the real world self-defense style is hands up, protect yourself. Number one, don't get hit. Number two, get after it. Go in, let's do it. Many styles can be incorporated into this Taekwondo. It's the, it's the most uh, well regarded as the best all around martial arts out there. I know a lot of people think that martial arts is just about defending yourself if, in case you're in a confrontation, but it's also a lot about really staying in shape, 
good cardio, flexibility. Can you speak about that a little bit? I mean, do you have students come in here that really don't aspire to be a black belt, but they really want to just stay limber, stay in shape? And of course, if they ever get in a bad situation, they can take care of themselves. But I guess you have people that all across the gamut, like, I want to be a black belt. I just want to be really physical, physically fit. What do you, what's the majority that you see out there? We get, the answer is yes, we get all those kinds. And many of those students don't even realize that that's why they're, they're starting here. And what I mean by that is parents will bring kids in. We get all kinds of kids. The shy, undersized, quiet kid who can't make eye contact with an adult, much less speak to them. We get the gangly, tall, you know, for his, his or her age, uncoordinated kid that the parents say, okay, we need to do something with this. The slightly overweight, self-conscious kid. We get kids on the autism spectrum. We get kids on the um, Asperger spectrum. Many counselors and therapists, you know, suggest martial arts as a an activity. Aside from the fact that it gets them up off the sofa and video games. Right. What's the average age student that you have? Ooh, it'd be hard to say or the maybe. average, but we take them as young as six. An exceptional five and a half right. who can really pay attention, follow direction, but six on up. I've gradu we've graduated over the years, young, uh, black belts as young as almost nine, all the way. The oldest was a 72-year-old gentleman. One gentleman, a good friend of mine who was in town this past week, 66 pounds he lost. John, if you're out there listening, you know who I'm talking about. Lost 66 pounds on his way from white belt to black belt. Incredible, inspiring stories. All women who come in and, and learn how to, how, they have this innate confidence now. Right. Once these skills, once you acquire these skills, you feel better about where you're going because you learn other things. Awareness, you know, your own personal space, defensive maneuvers to, if you ever get in this kind of situation, you know, we say all the time, awareness is your best defense. Well, if you took children as a group and then took adults as a group, mm -hmm. on average, how long does it take someone to go from white belt to black belt? If you could just average every one together, male, female, athletic, not athletic, just what's the average time it takes to go to white belt to black belt for the, for the kids group and then the adults group? Two years, three years? If you, if it depends on a couple of things. With ability, the right attitude, and consistent attendance. So in the juniors program, well, every, Everybody's starting off, adults from 6 to seven, 60 or 70, required to have come to at least two classes a week. But once you get to the advanced belt, that is the sixth belt on up and beyond, you're required to come three classes a week, two advanced belt and one beginner belt class a week. So you don't forget that early stuff. You keep drilling it. With regular, consistent attendance and the right attitude and ability, you have to be able to do these things, perform these maneuvers, before you can get a promotion. So with enough reps, consistency, three years probably, three years from white to black, you know, the belts seem to come pretty quick at first because there's so little to learn in the beginning. You can't absorb much. You get overwhelmed with too much. And then once you figure out how to learn, then it's repetition and repetition, then you get to be pretty good at it and you can take on more information. So in those intermediate belts, there's a huge jump because now it's, it's five different kinds of moves and all these kicks and all these wrist releases and, and close range and sparring and, so that by the time you get to the advanced belts, this is, it's not too much. You, you've memorized and can proficiently perform all those moves. So about three years, I'd say. Okay, so a business like this, a martial arts school or academy, what are some of the really unique challenges that you face, and how do you overcome those challenges? Unique challenges, new students, retention, current students. How do you go about getting new students? We advertise in a couple of different ways. We have a pretty good Facebook presence. We, many of our students and parents speak well of us on Yelp and Facebook, and, and um, we have a pretty good presence on Twitter. I mean, uh, uh, Instagram as well. We don't often 
we don't post much on Twitter, but we have a presence on Twitter. But we have some great presence on Instagram, and then a huge presence on Facebook. I think the last time I looked, a thousand and six followers. So I mean, you know, it's for a small dojo like us, it's pretty good. We get excellent reviews, great recommendations. You know, the best, the best compliment, uh, uh, review, um, uh, uh, re referral is word of mouth, and we get a lot of word of mouth. Well, one of the challenges you mentioned is retention. Is mm -hmm. there a strategy? How do you attack that challenge? One, make it worth staying for. Make these classes fun, challenging, informative. Kids have to want to be here. You know, Truth be told, I don't want a kid who doesn't want to be here because it spoils the, the attitude of others. And sometimes this is not the sport for them. But one, make, make the classes worth staying for so that you feel like there's a value. Two, offer incentives. The longer commitment you give me, the better price I'll give you in tuition. And three, so that it's, well, I guess it falls under make it worthwhile, but constantly teaching something more. How about advice for somebody that is wanting to get into this business? What kind of advice would you wish you could have given yourself years ago when you first got started that you know now? Uh, whew, what would I... Expand your mind. Expand your mind. Be open to trying other things. Everyone has a plan. Uh, but I would say, I, I wish I had been more open to doing things differently. You know, when I took over, there were some things I wanted to change. Everyone probably would have uh, in my position. And I changed them. Some things I thought we should be doing, some things I didn't want to emphasize as much that I thought we should spend time focusing elsewhere. And then I had a couple of ideas from people. and I said, that's, that's a pretty good idea, and I didn't quite work them in and I would say these these students can take it you, the more you throw at them the more they absorb get to it right away I'd have started the more emphasis on the grappling sooner uh, we used to wait for example on teaching the smallest the juniors the beginners we'd wait till they get to that sixth belt before we showed them some of the things that we we teach the advanced belts well I threw that out after a while you know what no the more I throw at them the more they learn let's throw it at them from the start and now from the very beginning, we're learning more jujitsu. From the very beginning, we're doing the most difficult kicks. And they're not doing them perfect they're, or even well. But they're getting over their shyness to try it. That's the love about teaching kids. They'll try anything. Explain it, how to do it, show it. They'll give it a try. It's great. It's actually quite inspirational. So you wear all the hats, I guess, don't you? You're the marketer, accountant, <laughs> uh, new students, I, uh, instructor. I mean, is is there, what, which are these areas do you just dislike the most? And I guess would be the accounting side, uh, the, the bookkeeping side. You nailed side. it. Yeah. Yes, I do wear all the hats. Some happily, others begrudgingly. I love teaching. I love uh, meeting the new students who are considering why should I come here and parents asking the 50 questions. I'm happy to answer them what all. What are the most common questions they ask? Uh, well, the, the most common are... How old do you start them? How much, you know, how tough is it? Is it going to be any fighting? And, uh, you know, and is, is my child, you know, okay for this? Do you think that they're all right? Should they, they've always wanted to. They've seen all kinds of movies. You think they'll be okay here? And I get over that. They, get, they think they're going to get their head knocked off or something. Some parents think that. Others, parents say, we got to get this kid off the sofa. And we need to get him in something. Why here? And that's why. Well, I do they him. resist sometimes when they have a child like that? It says we got to get him off the sofa and get him in here. The the kids resist. Yes. Really. Never the parent. Do they? Sometimes have, the kid over goes. Time, they, start, oh. they, they start turning around and really. And then they do. Again, if you make it fun, informative, and why and how this could apply to them, we win them all. We win them over. Now there are some kids who are really affected with peer pressure. Oh man, you're gonna break up our, our, uh, you know, Among Us group or you know, video game play. Right. You're gonna break up our group of so and so. Come on, man, we're starting robotics, and they get pulled into that. It doesn't happen often. 
once we get a kid and show them how fun it can be and how this can apply to their life, they, we get them. Yeah, now, you asked about the hats I wear. Yes, the office work is the worst. I take attendance and I have to pay bills and I have to deal with taxes and federal and state. And, uh, I don't understand a lot of that. So I'm relying heavily on my accountant, my, my uh, accounting lady. She's great. She's always driving all the way over here just to help me out. Okay, Garvin, let's get on the phone. And sh Otherwise, I'd be lost. Do so you... some of those I have to wear. Luckily, we're doing well enough that I don't have to worry too much about it. <laughs> well, there's probably, I guess, a software you use for oh, memberships sure. and things like that that probably help you out a lot. I guess if someone doesn't show up, it shoots them an automated email. That's exactly what happens. It keeps like track that. of attendance and billing is automatic. That's why I encourage people to, hey, if you sign on to a program, that's the beauty of our place, by the way, uh, versus some of the big box dojos out there. There's one who opened up right down the street, 200 plus dojos across America. The owner isn't even a martial artist. A bunch of first degree black belts teaching class. So once you make black belt, you, you've proven you know the curriculum and can perform it adequately. Second degree black belt is getting better at that. Learning how to teach. Second degree is assistant instructor. Third degree is what you really want. From third degree on up, you're instructor level. Being able to teach any kind of kid, any kind of adult and being able to work with almost they're breaking it down teaching it master instructor being even better and teaching the teachers being able to do that all of course once you do this professionally you get into the fifth degree range but uh, yeah I, I the hardest part is is the retention the other back office stuff the rest is fun for me I got no, I feel like I retired. I tell people all the time. Except when you're doing the accounting. Except, oh, I'm back in the office. No, I, I really feel like I've retired. Where do, or what belt is it that people usually drop off or lose interest? That's a good question. That's a good question. I tell people, of new parents all the time, look for these things. Help me out with this because you're going to see two plateaus on the way from white belt to black belt. The beginning belts come quick. They're fun. You're learning new things all the time. Which belts are those? White, orange, green. Even White, in, orange, and green. Right. Even in the purple because the combinations are so different. And right about purple and blue, there's a plateau because you're drilling those same things. And they're just tired of seeing the, the same things over and right. over. Is that what it is? But that's rep. How do you get to 1,000 reps? Right. One at a time. Let's go. We need number 806. Let's go. Then... That next belt comes, and then the next belt. Once you get into the advanced belts, well, now there are more class requirements. You have to acquire. See, when you come to class, you complete a class, you get a mark on your belt. You get enough marks, you get a belt stripe. You get enough stripes, you can take a test for the next belt. Two stripes per belt. A minimum of eight classes, as many as 16 per stripe. But in the advanced belt, it's three stripes, and a minimum of 16 to 32 classes per stripe. So that's a lot more. Right, yeah. And the second plateau is right there after blue center and brown. You finally learned all 25 combinations plus the eight fundamentals, plus all the kicks, plus all the close range. Now you start on the road to interpreting it to your preferred style, your abilities, and then black belts in sight. But those two plateaus come right there on the third or fourth belt and right there in the sixth, seventh belt where they kind of plateau. It seems like it's going to take forever. And then once they get past that second plateau, well, then black belt's in sight. I can't quit now. And once you get students to that part, you get nine out of ten of them. Okay. A couple have broken my heart over the years. A couple recently, this one girl who dropped out of Red, red Center, she's so close, so close. And then another gentleman, a young guy, his... Uh, sisters are excellent martial artists herself, but he got so close. Uh, I have other interests now, and I want to go do something else. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Oh, once you're a black belt, you're a black belt forever. I tell students all the time, especially those who, who come back after a layoff, you never lose your rank. You might have to go back and review and familiarize yourself, but I'm not going to start you back at white, but you never lose your rank because you earned that rank. We didn't give it to you. So I tell people all the time. I don't give these belts away. 
I don't. I don't sell them. I don't give them away. You earn them. Does it ever cause friction? Does, ever, does anyone ever say, you know, I really think I should move from, from green to purple? Does it ever cause friction? And that's got to be a more a, often with a kids, challenge, huh? More often with kids than adults and never with parents. The parents trust us. But you, you tell me do they, they come to you or do you invite them to do the next test? We invite them. Do they ever See, try to pressure you like? That's the question. That's the real question. Kids will ask. This is my eighth mark. Do I get my second stripe now? Remember, it's eight to 16. You're not quite ready. Okay. I don't know if you, you're ready for this next belt test. Well, I know all the stuff. Well, let's see. Attention, ready position. Show me number 16. Oh, let's see. Oh, oh. Are you ready? <laughs> you got to know it like the back of your hand. Right, yeah. Well, uh, uh, such short notice. Ask me, number 16, I'll do it right now. You know what I mean? Right. Well, you're a fit to be Exactly. So. Are you really ready? So remembering the moves is one thing. That's, that's halfway through the belt. Performing them proficiently is the other half. Well, have you ever considered opening up another location? I mean, Dallas-Fort Worth is a huge area, and I'm just curious, or maybe you really like being in one spot, keeping life simple. It's but all ever, part of my master plan. Uh, conquer the world. <laughs> I have thought about it. The part, the hard part is, is uh, instructors to keep those classes going. Anywhere else I might open, I want to offer seven classes a day like we do here. We used to offer more. A couple at noon for those parents who want to take a long lunch break and you know those stay-at-home moms who want to come in. Right. Then it dwindles to two or three and it's just not worth coming in. We've offered Saturday, more Saturday class, but we still offer a Friday class. And, you know, our schedule has evolved over the years like it is. We offer a teens-only class because our membership has evolved. We have a lot of big teenagers. It's just too easy. They don't want to spar against 8- and 10-year-olds. They need somebody more. But they're not quite big and strong enough for the adults that spar with us, you know? So we created that teens-only class. So... Have I ever considered opening other locations? Yes, but the tough, tough part is, is getting an instructor who can keep up that many classes a day. I don't want to go in someplace and only be open three days a week and offer you know three classes a night. Well, in closing, what do you, what are last words you'd like to say about your business here and martial arts in general? Well, considering that you're an entrepreneur uh, channel, and I pre first off. Oh, thank you for thank you coming for, on board. Thank you for asking me to speak. Sure, my it, pleasure. I, it's, it's my honor. Uh, don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself about what you're getting into. It takes a lot of work, and at first there isn't going to be a whole lot of pay. Tough it out. Keep at it. Just like there's an old, we have many different quotes painted on the wall. A black belt is merely a white belt that never gave up. So true. In taking over or starting one of these businesses, you have to have some business savvy. You know, you can't overspend what you make. You got to have some starting capital. That's true. Takes time to build your membership. Takes time to build it. Keep at it. Don't be discouraged. Do you believe in yourself or don't you? And then be try to be good at it. You can't just want to get into it for the money. Are you any good at it? I had a lot of feedback that I was a pretty good teacher. So when he, my, the founder of the place, asked me if I consider buying him out because he wanted to go back to retirement, you know, I think I do. I want to do this for a living. I like doing it. It's fun to me. I, I, I look forward to going to work. I hate messing with the book stuff. But the advice I would give, don't kid yourself. Believe in yourself. Take it seriously. And then give it everything and don't quit. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. you got to overcome that. Man, I went with blinders toward the goal. Up the membership. Make this more fun. Teach an all-around kind of curriculum. Uh, I think that if you put out good karma into the world, it comes back to you. And all those reviews we get, all of those word-of-mouth referrals we get, that's proof of it. Well, I've researched you guys before I contacted you and I noticed you guys have been around for many years since 1980 and you've got the most amazing reputation and I know so many of these schools pop up all over the place and they disappear for whatever reason but 
longevity says a lot, and that's why I reached out to you and asked you, hey, could I come out here and, and uh, put you on this channel? And again, I really appreciate it, Garvin. Thank Thanks you a very lot. much. I appreciate you. I think the biggest takeaway from Mr. Garcia's experience as an entrepreneur is when he talked about how he wished he had an open mind in the earlier years when he took over this business. And I really love the fact that how applicable that is in so many ways because so many businesses do business the way it's always been done and they don't open up their mind and try new things and explore new ideas that may could expand their business. I hope this video added value. I'm Curtis Mulberg. Thanks for watching.